I see women muting themselves in spaces where they actually should be the loudest voice. And so sometimes that looks like in your head, you believe the thing you have to say or the contribution you have to make is lesser than. You've already opted yourself out of the conversation. It's okay if that idea is rejected or it's not heard the first time you say it. The point is about the practice. You have to practice unmuting yourself. Why did I become an executive coach? I saw lots of great people fail to get ahead at work, while their much less talented peers blew right past them. That made me furious, but also curious. What were great people getting wrong? It came down to helping them re-examine what drove success and then helping them make critical shifts one hard truth at a time. Feel like you're doing everything you were told, but you're not moving ahead at work nor having the impact you seek? Then welcome to 97% Effective with Michael Winderoth where we skip feel-good, happy talk and engage experts in pointed conversations about what it really takes to move the needle at work and your career. So if you feel stalled or frustrated or seek that extra edge as you move to the next level, then look no further. This is the Hard Truths Playbook you never got. Hi, I'm Michael Wenderoth, and you're listening to 97% Effective. Partnership. It's a word that's going to come up many times today. How do you get into the partnership in a top professional services firm? How does partnership build power and influence and enable you to amplify your impact and get things done? Today's guest embodies the word partnership, and I thank her for writing an excellent blog post that inspired my introduction to her today. Kara Williams is partner at Credera a leading consulting firm focused on strategy, technology, data, and transformation with 900 consultants across the globe. She is responsible for leading the Denver office through growing people and brand. What I love most and why I invited her is that she's truly T-shaped, okay, that's consulting speak, for someone who has breadth and depth. A 25-year career in global strategy development, implementation, and transformation with top global firms, and someone who has a deep commitment to DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and bringing other people up through the ranks. We're gonna talk about her personal path to partner, how she ensured she made an impact when she got there, and how she brings her experience to mentor and advise others. Kara, welcome to 97% Effective. Thank you so much, Michael. I am beyond grateful to be here. What's interesting is you're a level two certified Sam, okay, that's a wine expert for those out there. You love to cook and you're a global citizen. And so what is a great pairing or just kind of out of the box combo you've recently discovered that that might delight the audience? Oh, I love that question. So I spent a year studying to become a level two certified sommelier. And one of the things that that study brought me was an education on food and wine pairing, of course, but a real passion for some of these wackier, lesser appreciated wines. So my answer is orange wine. So orange wine is white wine grapes that that when they're crushed and they're in the fermentation process, the skins are left on the grapes and it imparts a little bit of an orangey tinge to the wine as it ferments. It's also, if you, if you are a red wine drinker and you drink a little bit more bold wine, like a Cabernet Sauvignon, for example, you get a little bit more of that tannic astringency feeling in the mouth, dries your mouth out just a tiny bit. It's the equivalent on the white wine side too. So when the more skin tac- contact causes more tannins, more tannins cause astringency and that makes your mouth feel dry. Orange wine is great with impossibly hard to pair foods like artichoke. So my recommendation is find yourself an orange wine at one of your local wine merchants, get an awesome roasted artichoke with some lemon aioli or an artichoke dip, and enjoy the flavor combo that you'll get with both of those. Orange wine, I have actually never heard that term before. So so you just going to your supermarket or wherever you pick up wine, you could ask for that and they'll know what an orange wine is. And is there like a category? I've, I've, I've never seen a category of orange wine. 
So I, sometimes they're shelved with white wines or close to the rosé wines, but it is a category of wine and it's a style of winemaking that's, that's come back around again. It's actually a rather ancient form of winemaking that's just, it's had a resurgence. This is totally cool. Let's shift over now into this topic around partnership and looking at this in two levels, kind of your personal path and then also how you as, as partner and even before that, advise and mentor others, bringing those folks up through the ranks as well. And if you look back on your 25-year career, I was thinking, could you maybe describe some phases, laying those out in either food or wine or some analogy that we can just think of to look at your career? Yes. This question was extremely inspiring. And so my head went immediately to Samin Nosrat's salt, acid, fat, heat. So that's the example that I'll, the framework I'll use for, for this. So when I am coaching and mentoring people toward building their own paths to power or, or you know, uh, building out a sphere of influence, the salt piece is do bold things. We've all had that moment where we sprinkle a little bit of salt on something and it completely changes and improves the flavor of that thing. Next is acid. Be okay with conflict and abrasion. Stop caring as much when things don't go as planned or when your particular idea is the bold one in the room that others don't seem to be on board with. Fat is our personal strength, right? It's the basis for serious flavor. You know, soups and stews and roasted things all rely on some amount of fat to to infuse and impart that flavor. And When I'm talking with folks, I tell them their superpower is what they're already great at doing. And lastly, heat. Heat is finding ways to do and help those people above you in positions of power and be aware where that power lies in the organization so that you can build it for yourself. Salt, acid, fat, and heat. Correct. I love it. I know that you've got a lot of causes and things that you care deeply about. So I want to acknowledge that. And do you briefly want to share a personal passion or cause here before we talk about partnership? Absolutely. So I care very deeply about helping the to solve the housing problems in right now in the Denver community. It's been my home off and on for 21 years. It's a growing problem in our community, and it's a complex one. It crosses, you know shame and social norms and education and access to safe housing and public health and so many other things that make it really difficult to solve, which means the solutions also have to be equally complex in nature. And so throughout my adult life, I've volunteered for nonprofits that are focused on literacy or education or getting access for just underserved students in the, in, in the school system so that they perhaps break the cycle of being homeless with a family. There are a lot of students out there that live in cars. I've also been a board chair. I've, I've spoken at local, national, and federal government organizations on the topic of our unhoused population, how we might think about bringing the business and the civic community together to solve these problems. Ultimately, it's about when we provide safe housing, access to jobs, education, services, et cetera, and we're good neighbors, we all benefit as a community. To dive into the topic, and let's get really brutally honest and frank here, 25-year career, you've gotten to the partner level, and the numbers are pretty stark if, if we think about it. You know, there's that old saying, when people start their jobs, look to your left and right, you know, one of you is going to get there, the other two will you know, go out or not get anywhere. And generally the numbers, we could cite lots of them. I haven't looked at them recently, but the numbers of women who are entering, about equal, but the number of women who get to the, to the top partnership is nowhere near that. And so let's talk about in a professional service firm and, and first maybe look at this through the lens of your own experience, because I think you've done a lot of, you know, very savvy, important things we go back to your framework, I'm sure these are going to come up. And maybe to start, 
it, from, a, from a slightly different area, which is when you moved into the partnership there at Credera, I think you did some very savvy and important things to position yourself well and get started on the right foot. And, and I think this is really important for those who are entering. I mean, positioning and, and starting on the right foot helps so much. Could you share maybe a few of those things that you've done to really help you succeed in that role? Absolutely. So the first thing I did was I took a nod from the Stanford course that I was in at the time I started this role, and that was to lay out power objectives. And I had three. So one was to, I started, I had the awesome pleasure to start with two other female partners on the same day. And on that first day, when we were in onboarding class of some sort, I said, would you two be interested in meeting just, the, just us weekly so that we can navigate being new at this company as partners, as women, as professionals? And they, without any hesitation, said yes. So it started with weekly meetings with the three of us for most of the next six months. And then one day it dawned on me, I was excluding some female partners that had already hired in and or been promoted at Credera. So now that meeting still carries on 19, almost 20 months later, every other week, but it's all eight of us that are on the U.S. partner team, all eight of us females that are on the U.S. partner team. And it is truly, you know, we hear a lot of people talk about safe spaces and psychological safety it doesn't expire the higher you rise in an organization. You still need psychological safety. And so that's a space and a place where we can talk through some things and ask for help and, and think through and just, just reckon with, it's hard to be a leader today. This world is very, very chaotic and it's very, very complex and it's also very, very exciting. And the things that our employees are demanding of us now are very different from when I started my career. You know, we've, we've got employees that want to be activists in their community, and we have to think about how that looks in terms of how they represent our brand as an employee and, and all sorts of other. These challenges are real, and, and they're interesting, and they're complex, and they need to be thought through in spaces that I think give people the most amount of opportunity to, to dig into some of the harder aspects of, of those issues. The second thing in my power objective was to deepen a relationship with the global CEO that I report to and our chief innovation officer. Why those two? Well, one, I'm new as a partner in an organization. It's really important that I get to know and understand how to help that person succeed. I'm passionate about innovation. It was one of the things that certainly attracted me to this job. And I wanted to make sure that, you know, that chief innovation officer's goals and mine were aligned or were there opportunities where we could divide and conquer. And again, I, I admire both of these people and, and believe that together we can achieve a lot more. And lastly, I had a goal to cultivate my personal brand and be known in Denver business circles and civic circles and C-level circles and so I set different bars for myself. Part of it is something you've already referenced, which I'm super grateful for. It's, I love to write. And so I have been posting a series of articles and blogs and things like that that are at the intersection of kind of me as a person and me as a business leader. And so that's one way that I have been cultivating my personal brand. And it led to some really interesting conversations with people that I've wanted to get to know in the Denver community. And I would say within six months of me really putting some time and effort into it, I've been quoted, I've been published in different, you know, documents, journals, blog posts, I've done videos, and I've built relationships with some of the top CEOs in Denver. Those three points, if I could ask one or two questions, because I think you were very clear that these were three things, this, this, this group that you could have a safe space and talk about things that you were going through with that has carried on those top two, two leaders being very attentive to what you know, was important to them, and then this, this personal brand. That, to start with the third one, the personal brand, I mean, I think a lot of people, when they see that, they, it's about talking about ourselves and, and you know, self-promoting is the, is the word that makes people very uncomfortable, particularly certain groups, and we see that 
you know, through some of the research also, women tend to be more humble and not want to do these things. Was, was writing about the causes that helped you kind of bridge that, or are there some other techniques that you would recommend in terms of creating a personal brand without feeling like you're self-promoting and talking about yourself all the time? I, I think for me, it comes down to I, I write about what I care about. And, and they are very point in time. You, you will get a sense of me at a point in time if you read any of the articles that I have published on LinkedIn. And you will get a further sense of me in the blog post that announced my joining Credera as a partner. And the reason for that is it's, it, it's how I process certain things. So the article before the one I just published was about the school shooting in Uvalde, Texas. My spouse is an educator, and it was just one of those moments where I got to thinking about how the intersection of innovation, business, education, social norms all were swirling around. And it was difficult for me to think clearly, and so I needed to write. And and the output of that writing was the article really honoring my spouse and the work that he and his fellow education colleagues do but it was also about how there's heartache in just living in a world where that happens. And for what it's worth, right? I, I'm not, it's not self-aggrandizing. It's not talking about what I might do well as a business person. It's just assimilating all these different things. And that frankly is part of my personal brand. It happens to be something I'm very good at doing. I don't need to say I'm good at doing that. I need to write and let you read it and you have your own reaction to it. Yeah. Yeah, the pieces are are really excellent. We'll share some of those, uh, a way of processing, as, as you talked about, and causes that you believe in. You've been listening to 97% Effective with your host, executive coach, Michael Winderoff. If this interview is making you think, make sure to share it with a friend. Now, back to our interview. The second question that came up as you were talking through those three pieces we, we jumped right into to talking about power. And, and of course, that's a topic that makes a lot of people feel uncomfortable. It conjures up notions of Machiavelli and so forth. And, and I would say a lot of people out there would, would say, ah, setting up this group with the partners. Well, you guys are already partners, right? So you, <laughs> you know, there's, there's already some safety in that. You've got your position. In some ways, you're probably not competing with each other. If you think about this, you know, in a firm, if we take you like a level down, right? you're on the partner track and you were to form that same group. I think there's always this, you're at once and you're always doing this with colleagues. You're collaborating, but at times you are competing depending on the firm's culture or promotion process. What dynamics might be at work or how would you manage this? Hey, we're getting a group and we're sharing certain things, but that might get used against you. That may be giving someone else an advantage. This competing versus collaborating, which, which can happen at the middle and ranks going up. Thoughts on that? Oh, my. To me, this is such a great analogy for why listening and observation are very important skills to continue to hone the higher you rise in your career. And the reason I say that is what looks like collaboration in one forum maybe competition in another. So you might work together with someone to, and I think women in particular have felt this a decent number of times. You work with a male colleague as a, for example, to develop a solution to something. And then you go into a room to present it and the guy gets the credit and he gets the competitive edge. And it wasn't intentional necessarily or or malicious. It was, he took the mic, right? Or you agreed that he would take the mic. And the, the norm is, well, it must have been his idea or something like that. So just using that kind of as a, an example, I would say, I, look, business is competitive and it is also collaborative. You need both of those things to be successful. So as I'm advising people that are at our principal level or our senior manager level, I, I'm talking to them more about it's, it's not about being the most competitive or the most collaborative. It's about finding ways where the intersection of your strengths, your knowledge of the organization, both from a politics, influence, and power perspective, and 
being clear about what you want to go achieve are all lined up consistently. And to get there, undoubtedly, you will have to be the best at something. That competitive piece will have to show up in the form of you doing really well. The collaboration piece will also show up in the form of you can't do it alone. The number one thing that held me back from getting to where I wanted to go, which career-wise was an aspiration to be an equity partner in a consulting firm, was I spent way too long believing in the just world myth, right? I worked so hard believing that someone else was going to push me up the ranks that, you know, I even set a target time frame to make it here and I missed it by seven years, seven whole years. And it was because I believed someday someone would see all the work I'd been doing and that would be my ticket to the partnership. And it wasn't. And the second hardest lesson related to that was I had to get out of my own way. And there were plenty of people during, especially that seven years after I had missed my personal goal, that were trying to tell me, trying to coach me, and I was not listening. I was not ready to listen. I resented people who were trying to help me. And it, it took a moment of clarity, frankly, for me to snap out of that. Those two things are powerful. And so for me, I'm trying to coach people to short circuit both of those things as quickly as possible. So don't, don't rely on the just world as a means and also get out of your own way. So what was that, the thing that, that snapped, <laughs> or not snapped, th- this moment of clarity that caused the shift? Whew. In 2017 and 2018, I was being headhunted by a couple of different firms. And I was looking to leave a large global firm at the time. And one of, the, one of the roles just was a clearly not going to be a fit for a variety of reasons. The other one was really intriguing, and it was a firm I had talked with on two separate occasions. And the first time, they were at a part in their growth journey where it, was, it felt a little small. It felt like it was more of a lateral move. I, just, I couldn't see the promise of the future. So I, I, I politely declined. Another time it was, we just, it still doesn't feel right. It didn't really get into a formal process. This, the last time, it was a very formal executive interview process that took months. I did coffee chats. I did one-on-one interviews. I did group sessions. And it culminated with this almost you know Harvard-esque business case presentation with a group of people who some were there to be supportive, some were there to be combative, And then it transitioned into a social situation where I just felt bombarded by people I didn't know. I had no idea, would they they report to me? Would they not? It was exhausting. But I had run that gauntlet. And I am the kind of person that prepares very well. And generally, I feel good about the outcome. And very rarely am I disappointed, which, bad on me. I got a call and they said, no, we're not going with you. And I sat in a, in a London hotel room. I absolutely cried. That's, that's true. It was hurt. It, I felt hurt, a profound sense of loss. I was disappointed. And then the next thought I had was, all right, get up, Kara. This is, this is just a thing. So what do you need next? And I thought about all these moments you know, trying to get to the place I I really wanted to get to. And the only constant in all of that story was me. I can't blame people for not wanting to extend an offer. I can't blame people for not seeing, you know, that I, I desperately wanted to be admitted to the partnership and I kept getting told I wasn't ready and I wasn't necessarily paying attention to the details behind the why. So I, uh, I sent out a request for an executive coach and I hired one. And that's the beginning of, I mean, that, that's been four and a half years now. That has been the most catalytic moment in my career from a personal growth and, and achievement perspective. Yeah, let's talk about that because you do a lot of coaching yourself. You, you've, you've mentioned this. And this catalytic moment, I've seen it with my clients working with them as they struggle with things, mental models, fear, etc., I mean, that coach is actually how 
I believe I know you <laughs> because when I met you, I said, wow, you've, you've made a transformation. This is, you know, knowing a l- very little bit about you. And so I wanted to know, cause you mentioned it was a coach. And mm-hmm. so that's how I became very good friends with Bonita and tell us, you know, what were some of the things that as a coach that, that she did that helped you so much? It started with our first conversation. And so, you know, while you, you right, you have not been a coach. You absolutely have been a coach to me, Michael, through our Stanford experience. And, and so I, I'm not want to underplay the influence that you've also had. But to answer your question specifically about Benita, from our very first conversation, which was a screening conversation, I felt like she knew me as a human. And, and that's the best way I can describe it. And it was through the way she asked a couple of questions. One was about my childhood and upbringing. And one was a behavioral situational question, something similar to what happens when people, when you think people don't hear you in the room. And I just went, whoa, okay. I think I need to hire this woman to be my coach because she, she gets me in a way that I frankly have not really experienced. She helped me take my guard down. I came up in business starting in the mid nineties, especially in a world, a consulting world that was very male dominated. And so I assimilated, right? I tried to mimic behavior as much as possible because I felt like that was the fastest path to success. And I lost a little bit of myself along the way. And so that turned into a shield or a guard or a wall, whatever metaphor you want to use. And she helped me take that guard down in our sessions and help me be receptive to not just her coaching, but also how I'm taking in elements in the world. Because when you have your guard up, you're, you're filtering. Yeah. You're not taking in everything. And so what did she really do? She helped me define, sharpen my personal guidestones, which helped me focus on different things at different moments in my career. But it's really the intersection between the things I care deeply about from a a values and compass kind of perspective with the things that are important for me to see in others. And both of those things help me navigate influence, power, politics, relationships, you know, conflict, all of the above. I wanted to ask you here as, as well, because you do coach and advise so many, and as you reflect on your path and you've shared a bunch of that, are there particular things again, to go right at it, that women need to be aware of as they're moving up for the ranks, if that is indeed, you know, they want to get to partner. Everyone has different definitions of success or where they want to go. But you've probably seen common mistakes, not that they're necessarily mistakes, or things that undercut or don't help you on that track. Any one or two you want to particularly call out? I'd love to answer this question with a part A and a part B. So I think specifically as it relates to traps or stumbles that maybe women experience more frequently, it's we convince ourselves, I call it muting yourself. So I see women muting themselves in spaces where they actually should be the loudest voice. And so sometimes that looks like in your head, you believe the thing you have to say or the contribution you have to make is lesser than. You've already opted yourself out of the conversation. So I encourage people not to think about muting themselves. And so what's the converse of that? The converse of that is actually speaking up and saying something. It's okay if that idea is rejected or it's not heard the first time you say it. The point is about the practice. You have to practice unmuting yourself. It's a behavior, and sometimes it's more prevalent than others. It depends on people's cultural upbringing and their sense of self-confidence and all of these different things. So that's, that's one aspect. I would say the other thing that has less to do with gender has more to do with what are the things that really hold people back? There are many, and I've certainly perpetrated some of these myself. They get in their own way. Right. And that, that looks like so many different things to so many different people. We, I, I talked about how I got in my own way. I dug my heels in and basically decided that there was 
that my way was the only way and that rejected all other ways. Uh, they can't reckon with playing the game. Right? Like you said before, they think it's Machiavellian, they think it's narcissistic, whatever. I, what's funny to me about that now that my own eyes have been opened is if you look at a school play yard, games organically form and disband all the time. Sometimes it's a game of chase. Sometimes it's how fast can you climb to the top of a tower. Sometimes it's a pickup football game, a soccer game. That's okay. The game can change based on the rules you're willing to play it by. And that doesn't negate your ability to play the game well. And then the last thing is they don't build in their in internal networks. And sometimes they're external networks as well. But businesses are, are entities, they're organisms, they have people and people have priorities. And in order to get to a partnership position, a C-suite position, you have to have a coalition. It is not a solo exercise. It is a team sport. And who you pick to be on your team matters, big time. It's also fun. And I think that's something that is intimidating to people. They don't see the fun aspect in building their internal network. If there are people I have weak ties with that I'm reaching out to now some 15 and 20 years later because they're in positions of authority at clients maybe we want to do business with. And because we mutually put in the work to build a relationship years ago that might have gone weaker over the last decade or so, doesn't mean it's not still a good relationship. Right? There's this a false perception where like every relationship has to be deep and only deep relationships get you where, somewhere. And I mean, I, there was a, a LinkedIn study done recently that talked about how, how much benefit people get from weak ties. Yeah. Weak ties being those that you're not spending all your time with or like you. Those three reflections, and, and I will say this, I know we have gone straight at it to talk about women, but I think that comes up in lots of groups. You know, introverts I coach who are white men. <laughs> yep. Certainly Asian culture, which I come from, you know, you're much more heads down. You are not speaking up. And so... Your reflection on, on reframing that, thinking about what may be holding you back, and, and a part that you brought up, which I think not enough people, you actually use the word fun, <laughs> which is to find some, some joy in those things. And I want to ask a specific question on the networking because this one comes up a lot. Thinking about this as a team sport, who the people you pick and being very strategic about that, there is lots of good research that a sponsor, particularly if you're kind of early on in your career is the thing that really accelerates you through. And so frequently, a lot of people are asking, well, I can get allies, coaches, mentors, and we, the research also shows that women in a lot of groups are mentored to death, but they're not necessarily sponsored. Sponsored being the person who goes to bat for you is, you know, during succession planning, they are bringing up your name. Any pieces of advice on either how to pick that sponsor or how to, you know, you don't just go up to someone, or maybe you can just say, like, will you be my sponsor? How does that process work where you can really get someone to sponsor and sit in your camp and advocate for you? Asking is a very important technique, but identifying is even more important. And that, that was part of your question. So I happen to be coaching a team member right now that is seeking a really important career milestone promotion. I feel very confident that will happen. When we started the conversation, I gave that person my version of a power objective playbook. And so it's set the objective, measure the results week on week, and it's an eight week endeavor. And it's anchored in Professor Pfeffer's seven rules of power. And it's just to get people aware of how you can decompose these things. So for, for this person, it was very clear that the capability and skills required to be promoted were there. The advocacy they needed from me as their formal performance manager and coach, there. No sponsorship, no extended advocates. That was the, the real area of work that needed to be done. So I asked 
if they would provide a list of people that they thought would be essential toward building a coalition of sponsorship. And maybe we would find a single sponsor, clear sponsor in that group. Maybe it would still be a coalition. And for most of the eight weeks, they went through and evaluated person by person, and we checked in every week on the progress. And basically what was uncovered was wasn't very well known about how great their skills and their readiness was. And so all they had to do was schedule meetings and talk with people and ask them questions like, hey, do you know I'm involved with this? Or let me explain one of our recent successes on this big client project. And inside of the eight weeks, it was very clear, not only did this person actually have sponsorship, but the most important piece of that sponsorship was actually for two individuals, formally asking them when the time comes and people are being put up and have to be endorsed, will you be my sponsor? And both people said yes. So being very direct and asking that, obviously after presenting the, the impact that they had made setting up those meetings with people. Correct. Yeah, it's not. It's definitely not a, will you be my sponsor without any context? There's, sure. there's work that has to go into it for sure. Yeah. That's... Excellent, just the way you've described that situation and how people can go about doing that, not assuming that a sponsor's suddenly going to come to them, right? Partners are busy. <laughs> they have lots of things going on. They may not know what is going on down in the organization. So very important to be doing that. As you've made this journey that you've shared and thought about power and influence and shared strategies and things that you do and you advise, how have those, those views on power shaped your approach to DEI? Yeah, so many different things. One thing I'll say is I, I'm, I am a fellow partner with our chief diversity officer. So not only are we literally fellow partners on the partner team, I am her partner in terms of I, I help lead the strategy pillar for our firm-wide DEI in addition to just being a personal ally advocate myself, that partnership, truly, that partnership is how we multiply influence. And influence has a huge impact on getting people to consider or reconsider trying something new or being open to another person's life experiences or practicing empathy. The more work we do, as partners to influence and impact, the more we can advance DEI strategy and DEI as part of our normal ways of working or, or corporate norms. Growth is uncomfortable. So is this. But when we do it in a way that makes people feel like they are growing instead of being told not to say something or to try a different thing, the more successful we are. Hmm. I, I, I love that around thinking about it as growth versus lecturing to people and how also you're amplifying your influence, particularly at the partner level, which carries a lot of weight, furthers DEI across the organization and, to your point, community also. You guys have a large and standing in the, in the community there. Yeah. We have a lot of techniques, you know, that we, we've brought third parties in mm -hmm. to help educate us. And one of the techniques I have really loved is the notion of calling in or calling out. And if you're calling someone in, it's maybe you heard something that you just want to address one-on-one -on -one with a person. And so it's a, a much lower tension situation. Like, hey, I heard you m mispronounce someone's name or, you know, something that's, it's very tangible, the thing that you're calling someone in about. And the purpose is to help someone understand the impact of what happened. Calling out is for those moments where something needs to be shut down. And building the skills and techniques to call someone in and call someone out is really important for advancing DEI. And it's also a way to just help cultivate healthy relationships. Mm. Kara, it's been an absolute pleasure. And if people want to see your work, writing, what's the best way to, to do that or connect with you? The best way is LinkedIn. And that's a great jumping off point for us to have more individual conversations. So I look forward to connecting with people. Great. An absolute pleasure and some 
incredibly useful gems and recommendations here in our conversation today. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thanks for listening to 97% Effective, where we skip happy talk and help you break through and ascend one hard truth at a time. Help others discover this show. Leave a review and rating wherever you listen to your podcasts. And if you like what you heard, you can get free resources, including the first chapters of Michael's book, Get Promoted, on his website, www.changwinderoth.com. That's www.changwinderoth.com.